We have a very interesting and exciting afternoon, uh, different than you expect, uh, so just pay attention. <laughs> Don't bother with your schedule. First of all, our next speaker was to have been a very wonderful person, Rosalba Ruiz Holguin, who is from... Uh, has had 17 years experience working in public health with a focus on border issues. She is a medical doctor, has a master's degree in public health uh, from uh, the University Automata in Juarez. She is a firm believer that the best way to prevent chronic disease is to start early in life by breastfeeding. She's worked previously for the Pan American Health Organization uh, from 98 to 2012, and she currently works for the Alliance of Border Collaboratives. She's a founding member and current chair of the Binational Breastfeeding Coalition and a founding member of the Latina Breastfeeding Leaders Group, and just recently selected for the National First Food Racial Equality Cohort. And unfortunately, she could not join us today. She has a serious illness in her family. And so I am her substitute. <laughs> mea copra, mea copra, mea copra. Um, we have, she very kindly sent her slides and I want to share them with you because her message is very important. Breastfeeding, a view from the border. She works at the border of Mexico and United States. There are many issues there and breastfeeding is not very common. And uh, so I want to show you what her thoughts are. And here we see geographically where, where she's located and some, some of the um, uh, images of places that she deals with. And so what are the barriers to breastfeeding along the border? Now this looks like an, a, a familiar laundry list mothers with less schooling. And it's well documented that the less educated a mother, the less likely she is to breastfeed. Mothers who have no prenatal care. Not that our prenatal care is so excellent, not that we doctors are saying enough about breastfeeding, but no prenatal care is a real handicap. Some of these mothers have been told not to breastfeed. And of course, if they have a job, there's no maternity leave. And therefore, not only that, they probably have a very low, con low income, <coughs> low paying job. And they're not part of our healthcare system. And many of these women have complications of their pregnancies, complications of their delivery, and end up having a C-section. Now that's not to say that C-sections are a contraindication to breastfeeding, but they certainly don't make it easy. And there are many medical obstacles and many other issues. Now we also see in the other column that the mothers often have a Hispanic or a husband or a partner, and the husband gets jealous. Uh, there's a Spanish word for it. Um, I took French in high school, parlez-vous français. Uh, I don't speak Spanish, so I'm not going to attempt to this afternoon. But they are apt to get jealous. And, uh, and mothers that have lived in the United States for more than five years are often in this group of border women. And cultural beliefs 
about breastfeeding have been very counterproductive. So that they believe that if if you breastfeed, you can't drink, you can't smoke, you know, can't listen to a dirty dirty joke, um, and you have to re eat real good. So what's in life after you've struggled through a, a pregnancy? And a, a last dose is let's do both. I think. Don't correct me. <laughs> but these are some of the issues that these mothers face who are in these border communities. And when we look at the general uh, barriers to breastfeeding, uh, we, all, we all know those. Uh, healthcare provider apathy and misinformation. Hey, here in this room, I think we're all very pro-breastfeeding, but a lot of our colleagues are not all across the country, and we're working on that. As was mentioned this morning by our speaker, that medical education is so important on this issue, but I can tell you if it isn't in the exam, they're not going to study it. That's why we've en encouraged AAP, ACOG, and AFP to put it in the exam, and we're making progress. Um, and often, there's been insufficient prenatal pre med uh, education. Nobody talks, maybe you get a little prenatal care, but nobody talks about breastfeeding. Nobody tells you how to do it, and you don't know anybody who's done it, and your mother didn't breastfeed. And it's a generational thing. In the good old days when generation after generation breastfed and generation after generation lived together, there was always somebody in your little home that had breastfed. Not so today. In fact, young people try to move as far away as they can <laughs> from the previous generation. And what do we do? We send them home early from the hospital before our mother really has gotten straightened out and knows what to do and how to hold the baby. She's out on the street going home in a taxi cab. So that is a problem. And our, our follow-up is not good. Obstetricians think in terms of six weeks postpartum. A lot can happen in those first six weeks. And if you haven't figured out breastfeeding, you are not going to be breastfeeding at your first discharge of appointment. And out there in general, particularly in these communities along the border, the, the community is not supportive. The employer is not supportive. The airport's not supportive. Nobody's supportive. There's nowhere to go. Maternal employment, of course, is a big issue. Um, and uh, if you have a full-time job, of course, first of all, you need somebody to take care of your baby who's, who's supportive of breastfeeding and willing to feed your pumped breast milk and all of these issues. But you don't get time off. And there are no pumps even if you did. And nowhere to store the milk. Um, media portrayal of formula feeding as the norm. And we're going to come back to that. Promotion of distribution of um, formula from hospitals. Now, so many of us here are aware of baby-friendly hospitals, and of course, one of the f first rules is you pay for any formula you use. You don't accept free samples. Well, unfortunately, the healthcare facilities along the border have not gotten the message. And so if they have formula, they have free samples, they give away free samples, and they get coupons, and they get all of that advertising. And the bottom line, these moms are stressed. They've got lots of things to think about, to worry about, to worry about whether their breasts are going to make enough milk. It's too much. So we have some pictures here of a baby cafe, and many of you may be aware that baby cafes are a very new, interesting thing that's happening in many com 
communities. And they are uh, a baby cafe is some place in town where mothers can go with their babies and their breastfeeding babies and sit there and breastfeed and talk to other mothers, which is a beautiful idea. And as I look at these pictures, I see they must have a baby cafe uh, established. Of course, this working mother we're talking about with a low-paying job and no babysitter, she's probably not lounging at a baby cafe. But at what point in time when she gets a better job and has a babysitter, she too can go to a baby cafe. It's a wonderful movement, and I certainly support it, but I have trouble figuring out how our poor moms are gonna get there. So another program that's very well known and very successful has taken place in Texas. And many of you may have heard of it because Texas has been on the front of the march to breastfeeding. And they called it the Big Latch On. And it's uh, advertised throughout uh, Texas, uh, particularly along the border and in northern Mexico, encouraging everybody to breastfeed. And these mothers were invited to join in. And uh, of course, I think you've heard of these programs in, in other communities. New York, City, New York City does a big latch on, and many other communities have, where women bring their breastfeeding babies out into the public area and at least wheel them in a baby carriage if they don't stand there and breastfeed them. But it's another message that makes breastfeeding public that makes breastfeeding the norm. And until children grow up knowing that breastfeeding is the norm, we probably aren't going to change very much. And I'm happy to say my colleague, Dr. Mary Applegate, sitting up here in the front row, the state of New York was concerned about that many years ago. And we said, Children will not know about breastfeeding and embrace it unless they grow up knowing. And the state of New York has a curriculum from K through 12 that where schools should be mentioning breastfeeding all the way through. Now that doesn't mean they sit the kids down and say, well, this is how you breastfeed. But it means that when an opportunity arises, breastfeeding is con considered the norm. So if they ha they're studying kittens and ha having, having baby kittens, that they're getting breastfed by their mother, whatever opportunity there is. And this is part of what the big latch on is all about, having people know that breastfeeding is the norm. So I think we all know the benefits of breastfeeding uh, there are benefits to the baby, the mother, there are benefits uh, in the workplace, and, sh and you say, and how could that be? Well, actually, it's been shown that when mothers breastfeed, that uh, their babies are healthier. They don't need as much time away from work because their baby is sick, and they, too, are healthier. So, indeed, it, it interacts and impacts the workforce. And of course, school, the general environment, I mean, there's some interesting environmental studies that show uh, all of the uh, trash, if you will, from formula feeding, the cans, the bottles, the whatever, we're filling our landfills. Breastfeeding, we don't send anything to the landfill. And of course, it's impacting the world. Now, uh, yep. These are all the goodies in human milk. We know that. They're wonderful. Uh, the print is such, I'm sure you can't even read it right up here in the front, but it doesn't matter because we know that the constituents of human milk are the best for the human infant. And what I always like to point out is that the constituents for brain growth are very important. The brain doubles in size in the first year of life. Why? Don't we give it the best protein, the best nutrients, the best 
amino acids, anything you can think of to build that brain. It's our chance. Now, and here, we have a, a few more wonderful things because breastfeeding helps not only nutritionally, but anti-infectively, protection against infection, protection against allergy. Uh, it's good stuff. There are a few opportunities or circumstances in which breastfeeding is uh, contraindicated. Um, special cases, women may be advised not to breastfeed. Well, um, these special cases are usually mothers who have a drug addiction, who have a serious in infection, particularly HIV. They're not common. They're not your average mother. And these good souls who live along the border are probably not in that category. Uh, so medications are always a question, illnesses and so forth, but the incidence is very low. And as has been pointed out here, 2% uh, of the population are involved in situations in which they cannot breastfeed. No, I, I, I thought you'd like to look at this slide. I think it's kind of unique in that uh, these are, our, our author has called it breastfeeding falsies. I have no comment about that. <laughs> but uh, we, see, we see that uh, problems that, well, my baby was premature and I couldn't breastfeed. Well, hopefully the neonatologist has encouraged the mother to pump her milk and will be pre providing her milk for her baby because nothing is better for a preemie than the milk. Uh, my baby preferred the bottle. Uh, well, I mean, I don't know any babies who speak <laughs> at that time, but uh, I didn't have enough milk to nurse. That certainly reflects a situation in which a mother didn't have enough help. Most women can make enough milk. It has nothing to do with the size of the breast. It has to do with the amount of uh, active tissue and the help you get. Um, my breasts were too small. Well, same problem. My breasts were much too large to nurse. Oh, please. My baby refused to take the breast. Well, it was probably because mother wasn't taught quite how to help a baby latch on. And uh, I had to stop because I got breast milk fever. Well, I don't know that disease. Perhaps some of you have heard of it, but I've never heard of breast milk fever. Now, the real problem and the real problem in this area of the country or any area of the country where women are undereducated, underpaid, and undervalued, the formula companies have come in and provided information for these mothers. And we have never promoted breastfeeding by bashing formula. And there are babies who need formula so you will forgive me if I point out what happens when the formula companies talk to these mothers who have no, nobody talking to them and giving them the other side of the story. So they see these ads. Um, they're told that it's just like mother's milk, only better. Some scientist invented it, not just mother nature. And why do mothers choose formula over breast milk? Well, they're uncomfortable about having to deal with their breasts. Many women, unfortunately, grow up not knowing what they're for and have various concerns just even handling their breasts. Um, early on, I won't say it's the easiest thing in the world to do, I won't say it isn't uncomfortable, 
It may be even be a little uncomfortable, be wet all the time, but, uh, and they have convenience issues. If I breastfeed, I have to do it. If I bottle feed, he can do it. And then the, the problems with employment and school. Um, and many women have been told that if they breastfeed, that their beautiful breasts will sag. I tell you, it's age that does yes. that. <laughs> and the manufacturers have manipulated people into seeing their ads. And even in impoverished neighborhoods, you'll see ads about the value of formula. In, in Thailand, a former resident of ours sent us some ads in, in impoverished Thailand, and mothers were actually buying coffee creamer because it was cheaper than formula. So information is very misleading. And of course, the bottom line, nurses and doctors don't know enough about it, and that's probably true, and we're trying to help our colleagues. Uh, now, I wasn't terribly impressed with that cow anatomy, so I'll spare you that slide. Um, but these are the strategies of the formula companies. I think we all know them. Uh, they get their lo uh, logos everywhere. They exploit the lazy. Well, that's an interesting comment. Uh, and they start telling young women when they're very young, but probably one of the biggest problems is that they proclaim the similarities to human milk. Formula is made out of cow's milk. Cow, calves get up and waddle across the pasture on the first day of life. Their needs are very different. And they usually <coughs> add, in addition, a little bit of pseudoscience, a couple of references about uh, growth and development and so forth. And of course, the problem of getting stuff free. I mean, don't we all love free stuff? Uh, I love a coupon, oh my god. Um, and so there are all of these marketing issues that are a real problem. When we in the breastfeeding community have not promoted breastfeeding or helped mothers achieve that. And so what are the risks of formula feeding for the baby? Well, it's sort of the opposite of all of the advantages of being breastfed. We know that formula-fed infants have more allergies and asthma and, uh, possible, and in later years, because studies have been done all the way th through adult life showing that heart disease is more common in individuals who were not breastfed. And all of this, and, and o obesity. You know, one of the troubles with bottle feeding, and we're hospitals are guilty of this, we put the, mother to the, the baby to the breast if a mother's breastfeeding, and we give a mother a four ounce bottle for her baby if she's bottle feeding. Everybody thinks you're supposed to empty, you know, clean your plate, empty the bottle. First feeding, their stomach, a seven pound baby's stomach is less than a tablespoon, but they get an ounce and a half or so. So we overfeed a bottle fed baby from the very beginning. You cannot overfeed a breastfed baby. You can put a baby to the breast all you want. If they've had enough, they've had enough. And they've studied some of this to indicate that, that there are hormones in human milk that control the appetite. So there are many issues when it comes to fording, uh, formula feeding. And uh, nutritional deficiencies, uh, sudden infant death syndrome, the data, the statistics, it's much more common among bottle-fed babies. And necrotizing enterocolitis, that's the biggie today. Now that we have neonatologists willing to give formula, uh, give breast milk 
to preemies. We're seeing a tremendous change in the incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis, which is a, a disease predominantly uh, of prematurity and, of course, involves the GI tract. And so this list of the risk of formula feeding for the mother is just the reverse of the benefits of breastfeeding for the mother. Uh, reduced incident, uh, so uh, bowel feeding mothers have more breast cancer, ovarian cancer, more apt to be obese because you don't get the opportunity postpartum to get rid of that extra weight. Uh, you deliver the baby in the placenta and the rest is on you. Osteoporosis, data are good. You, you'd think a mother who, who gave all this calcium and phosphorus in her milk to her baby would uh, have osteoporosis, but no, Mother Nature has shown that as soon as you wean, you recalcify your bones, and women who have breastfed have had higher densometry after breastfeeding than they do after delivering and not breastfeeding. Um, rheumatoid arthritis is a, uh, a game of statistics. Metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease. Uh, it's suggested that women who breastfeed um, do better. Actually, the data is that women who are never pregnant and never, never do either, uh, have the greatest risk. Women who become pregnant but don't breastfeed are le uh, next least, and women who uh, have a baby breastfeed it have, are at lowest risk for these problems. Now we have uh, a little comedy from the co uh, from the border, and and. Then we can agonize over the problems with formula, that there have been recalls and there have been problems. And uh, we need to balance that with knowing that one good thing that's come out of so much formula study has been the research, so that we understand better the nutrient constituents. And it's been studied uh, very carefully. Uh, so. Um, yeah, there, there are problems. There, there are problems with any product on the market. Uh, and, uh, you know, so a batch may be produced that's deficient in one thing or another. Probably the one thing uh, we all remember um, was many years ago when there was uh, uh, no vitamin C in uh, formula. Um, and all of these other issues um, are not common. In the United States, our formulas are pretty well controlled. Uh, one of the problems with uh, um, impoverished countries and even at the border, they get, <coughs> excuse me, they get sent the outdated formula, they get sent the problem batches and have no control over it. So this is an interesting problem, rather unique to the border. Uh, and so uh, the list goes on, and this particular group of uh, people and patients and areas uh, get the worst uh, of the products. So it, it sounds terrible. You look at these lists, you think, oh my gosh, formula is dangerous. Well, it's not as good as breastfeeding. It's adequate. That's the word I like. It's adequate for babies who cannot be breastfed. But that's why we're trying so hard to have more babies breastfed for a longer period of, uh, periods of time and helping more mothers uh, to breastfeed. And uh, 
so our colleague finishes off her comments about artificial feeding and saying it's always risky. Well, you have to be careful. You have to put enough water in it. Yes, you can get dehydrated. Um, human milk is the proper balance. If a baby has diarrhea, human milk is the treatment. If a baby is dehydrated, the best fluid is human milk. <coughs> It has to be calculated and thought about if the baby is formula fed. So it is a challenging issue if everything isn't perfectly normal. So uh, no argument about that. Uh, so just looking at some of the figures and why um, underdeveloped countries are a problem. We see here the data for 34 developed countries um, and uh, look at infant mortality. Um, we were in 27 and we heard a little bit about that earlier when one of our earlier speakers where we United States mortality, infant mortality is higher than it is in some other countries that we th consider ourselves superior to. But it certainly is well documented and it's one of the reasons we're uh, addressing the issue. Um, also interesting comment that US ranks fifth in spending per student for school and that 66% uh, of all U.S. fourth graders scored below proficient on the National Assessment of Education reading test. They're not reading at grade level. I'm proud to say that Rochester, New York is on the top of the list. We have uh, high schools that rank in the top 10 of high schools in the United States, so I find this data sad. Uh, we see performance has not been good. And then the, our friend concludes that the achievement, achievement gap between low income and wealthy race and ethnicity has grown alarmingly. And here in this country, despite spending a lot of money U.S. poor population uh, has done badly, uh, and some populations are at far greater risk than others. The prevalence of con uh, chronic disease appeared higher in the United States uh, in 2014. 68% um, of adults age 65 and older had at least two chronic conditions. In other countries, this figure ranged from 33% to 56%. Well, it, it certainly is a concern for our health care system. And I think that is coming to suggest that there be some change. Comment that they formulate into this. Industry is worth $25 billion. And imagine if we took that money and spent it on breastfeeding. Uh, imagine that if every woman received the information and the incredible importance of breastfeeding when she, while she's pregnant, then the support she needs after having her baby, she could successfully breastfeed. And that is certainly the change we need uh, and if we could imagine that every healthcare worker were well informed uh, and p supported breastfeeding, if societies understood having healthy babies um, and healthy growth and healthy adults, that it would change the um, country's economy. This incredible income. E inc Economic impact cannot be overestimated. In the U.S. alone, human milk as part of the gross domestic product is valued at more than $110 billion a year, but two-thirds of this amount is lost because moms are forced to wean their babies prematurely. And
and uh, millions upon millions of dollars would be saved annually for health care costs. And certainly many of us are familiar with M Melissa Bartek's work at Harvard showing uh, actually person by person that we can save uh, $13 million a year in health care costs if our babies would be breastfed for the first six months. And another $10 billion for the mothers who breastfeed. So the simple act of breastfeeding, especially a loving bond between mother and baby, does have a profound impact on society. Let's tear down the barriers and make sure everything in our culture that can be done to support that breastfeeding is done. And these are the suggestions for how we do it. Give the mothers the support they need, develop programs to educate fathers, and fathers need to be part of this picture. And also grandmothers. Because so often a mother is working on something. If her, her own mother <coughs> didn't breastfeed, it's probably one of the greatest reasons women don't succeed. And provide mother-to-mother -mother support, peer counseling, uh, use community-based organizations to promote breastfeeding, and uh, so all of the things that we've been talking about, we heard earlier this morning and that we'll hear the next few days, are suggestions. And part of our challenge here today is to try and develop a program that we can do and will be carried out. Um, so the author continues to uh, elucidate and mention things that are important. Uh, standard of care and treatment and training for healthcare providers uh, ensure the access to services provided by the International Board Certified Lactation Consultants, uh, identify and address the obstacles to uh, donor milk, which is another whole issue in terms of donor milk and making it available for mother, uh, mothers who cannot produce enough milk. Uh, and uh, paid, paid leave, employees understanding, expanding all of these programs in the workplace that allow lactating mothers to have direct access to their babies. And uh, this is a uh, little message from uh, UNICEF, uh, which uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the message was because I don't think UNICEF is against uh, breastfeeding in pub public, but our, our author challenges us today, be relentless. I don't think there's anybody in the room who isn't relentless. Uh, don't give up, stand your ground, know the data, inform and share, be creative, uh, network and partner, Continue until breastfeeding is the norm, and certainly that's what we intend to do. Uh, and she pleads that uh, we make a, better, a world better supporting breastfeed. And I say this in behalf of our uh, wonderful speaker who could not be here, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>